Inner Voice. A heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello, everyone. It is so great to be with you. I'm uh, Fujian Zain. I'm a psychotherapist and author and the originator of the Awareness Integration Theory. Our conversation in um, Inner Voice is uh, about what matters most in our life. Our mind, our thoughts, our feelings, actions, and relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. I want to um, give you a couple of announcements. And um, first, I am going to be featuring uh, my two books, uh, Life Reset and the Awareness Integration Therapy. And um, it's going to be at the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books. So I'd uh, love to see you there. It's going to be in uh, USC, University of California, Alumni Park. It's going to be this coming weekend, Saturday, April uh, 23rd, and Sunday, April 24th. I will be at the booth of the Greater Los Angeles Writers Society, uh, Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m. Um, and Sunday from 12 to 2. So join me. Come in. I mean, um, Los Angeles Festival of Books is amazing. They have thousands and thousands of books and uh, people will come in with, um, and you, you, you can see all of them, but I'd love to see you at booth number 944. Remember, USC Alumni Park, booth number 944. I will be there with two of my books, Saturday, April 23rd from four to six and Sunday, April 24th from uh, 12 to four. I mean, I'm sorry, 12 to two. I have another announcement for all of you who um, have really um, asked about the um, awareness integration theory. I do have a certification program. I love uh, for you guys to be uh, certified in this because you're going to be a certified therapist or coaches um, on the awarenessintegration.com site and on Fujian app, uh, which is going to be launching this uh, summer. So the Essentials of Awareness Integration Theory will be uh, on a three-day uh, uh, conference in June 24th to 26th. So um, it's going to be 18 hours online. I do have, um, you, you can get CEUs for, uh, from CAMP, California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. Uh, just uh, contact me. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, I'd love to have you on, on um, our, our course. And um uh, for you to learn the awareness integration theory. Now, I want to share with you that I'm going to uh, chat with uh, two of the most amazing, amazing therapists. I have learned so much from them. I have studied imago therapy. I have worked with imago therapy with, uh, with couples for so many years. Um, I love these two people and I think that they are a jewel and truly an asset to the field of um, couples therapy and marriage and family therapy. Um, ready? Yes. And today I'm chatting with Dr. Harville Hendricks and Dr. Helen LaKelly Hunt, that they are the co-creators of Imago Relationship Therapy and a social movement called Safe Conversations. Internationally, they're respected as couples therapists, educators, speakers, activists, and New York Times best-selling authors their, uh, of their 10 books, including Timeless Classic, Getting the Love You Want, A Guide for Couples, have sold more than 4 million copies. Harville appeared on the Oprah Winfrey television program 17 times, and Helen was installed in um, the Women's Hall of Fame and Smithsonian Institute. And today we will be actually talking about their latest book, which is wonderful because they've added um, so much of the, uh, of the quantum physics to their theory and how it has evolved. So the must, it is a must. The book is called Doing Imago Relationship Therapy in the Space Between. So uh, don't go anywhere, we're gonna be with them for a short conversation and I am um, going to be back on the show again. So everyone subscribe to this podcast, my YouTube channel and connect with me through the website fujanzain.com or any of the social media. And I love to hear from you. So uh, don't go anywhere. Here it is, Dr. Harville Hendricks and Helen Hunt.
Hello, everyone, again. I am so excited to have Dr. Harville Hendricks and Dr. Helen Hunt with me. Uh, they are the Imago Therapy Guru, the founder of Imago Therapy, and we're going to talk about their latest book, Doing Imago Relationship, <clears throat> Relationship Therapy in the Space Between. So nice to have the two of you with me. Well, thank you. We are always honored to be on with you. You're such a distinguished person. Thank and you. Thank you. Um, I love this book. I was just going into it with all of uh, what you have brought in with from quantum physics. Um, and it's, uh, it was, it's fascinating. And it, one thing that I love about your work is it always makes sense. Oh. You know, it makes sense. Like you read this thing and it's like, well, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so for all of you who are out there, uh, the Imago uh, is the conversation of the image. And then you've talked about how the relationships are, uh, you know, we, we go after the image of, of uh, the, the romantic partner is almost the image of what we desired for um, our parents to be in that same symbiotic. And that was, was what it was. And then you, uh, the two of you have developed a whole new theory around it. So that was the stepping stone. And now you have completely uh, shifted it, not only from the self and that kind of symbiotic, but to, uh, to the outside world, to the relational world, and from a space within to this space out. Please yeah. share with us. Well, I, first, of, first I want to say that the space between uh, is a phrase that Helen uh, de derived, I think from Martin Buber and put it together, which is one of the indications that Helen is indispensable and has been indispensable to the development of Imago for the last 30 years that we've been, well, it's been almost 40 years that we've been working on this theory. And so that the space between as, as you said, uh, shifts the whole conversation from the self to the relationship. And in fact, we think that the, since the self is a derivative of relationship, that the relationship is primary rather than secondary. And it's been, the relationship has been secondary in the field of psychotherapy and even in marriage therapy ever since it's, uh, you know, ever since Freud launched psychoanalysis um, in the um, in the early in the late 19th century so what we uh, sort of evolved into without intending to was to make sense out of uh, couples which is and we finally became aware that uh, you can't um, make sense out of couplehood by staying focused on two individuals you have to make sense out of couplehood by paying attention to how they interact. That is the, and then we began to notice that the interaction between couples influences what goes on inside them. So instead of going inside and looking around and doing the exploratory work that psychotherapy had been doing for ever since, you know, for ever since Freud, that we needed to look at the quality of the interactive space rather than the intrapsychic space. And that, that led then to a theory of relationship. We have to talk about relationship, but in psychology, there are no theories of relationship. Relationship, just something you have, is something you can give up, it's something you can get, it's something you lose, it's a thing. And what began to emerge for us was a relationship is not a thing, relationship is the thing. It is the foundational reality, but there's nowhere to ground it because uh, classical physics was the ground of psychotherapy because classical physics said everything's made out of atoms and that got transformed in, in the uh, psychological world that the self was modeled after the atom as an autonomous, independent, self-sufficient thing and that we had no place for that. So we began uh, to look around. And Helen can talk about this be, before we actually met. And soon after we met, we had both read the popular uh, versions, the, the, um, the, the, the Tao of the Wilu Masters. And it was the Tao of Physics. It was the first popular book on quantum. And we had both read it 40 years ago. Yeah, but we had no, <laughs> it didn't occur to us. I mean, that that would have any resource for for couples therapy. Well, until 
about three years ago when we began to put together doing, doing Imago therapy in the space between was say, where are we going to ground relationship? And then all of a sudden, in our, shall we say, perpetual conversations about what the nature of reality is, we said, in quantum field theory, because quantum field theory is can be the human relationships are derivatives of the of the field of the quantum field, not the particle, but of the field itself out of which the particles arise. So as you can see, that began then to come together as a reorganization reorganization of the whole system, and that's uh, I don't know how interesting all that is to most listeners, but to us, it was a monumental intellectual shift. And if I could add one thing, when we were dating and Harville was lecturing on things, um, um, Dr. Zian, I like the way you said that what we write about makes sense. Uh, Harville was lecturing in wherever he was, anyone was interested in how to have a better marriage or how to have a better relationship. And that was a lot of people. They would call him and say, would you give us this lecture? And he would say there were three stages of relationship. Romance, romantic attraction. Wow, fun, great. That makes sense that you want to get married with romantic attraction. But people don't know that stage two is the power struggle. Oh, well, that makes sense because people have um, got married and then suddenly they aren't as happy as they were on their wedding day. Well, guess what? No one is. And then number, stage three, <clears throat> every, if you do a couple things in stage two, everyone can get to stage three. And he labels stage three real love. And that is why I wanted to propose to him but at the time, so this is my additive, I wanted, I had gotten a master's in counseling psych and I wanted to be a union analyst. And this is where I will say that even at the very beginning of Dr. Freud, uh, after Dr. Freud, there was Dr. Jung, mm -hmm. who Dr. Freud got mad at because mm -hmm. Freud says, says there was the ego, the self, and the unconscious. And Dr. Freud said, and underneath the unconscious is the collective. No, unconscious. Dr. Jung said underneath Sorry. the unconscious. Dr. Jung, Carl Jung said, underneath the unconscious is the collective unconscious. Well, Dr. Freud didn't like that, <laughs> but I wanted to be a Jungian analyst. And so I, this is when Harvard and I met, I was going to study to be a Jungian analyst. Yeah, so the ingredients of the ultimate relational emphasis uh, was in Helen's interest in Jung, uh, in which uh, Freud, Freud could be considered a, a, part, a particle, particle in the wave. And Carl Jung yeah. very early on brought in the wave. Yeah, in fact- We're, we're all interconnected through the collective unconscious. Yeah, I, I've forgotten the name of the physicist, but Jung was the therapist for one of the founding quantum physicist. Mm -hmm. So he, I'm sure, got some grounding and help in understanding the collective unconscious from uh, the physics uh, student, that, I mean, the client that he did an analysis with. Now, I forgot, I wish I could get his name back. Maybe he'll come back. I, I keep saying, as I get older, my secretary is slower and she has a card file system and doesn't know how to use a computer. So in a while, <laughs> she'll find the right. And so, so we would love to be on your, um, uh, the way you do presentations. Yeah. We hope in a couple of weeks, we can come back. I mean, yeah. we'll have more today, yeah. but next time we come back, we'll have the name of that other person yeah. that was Jung's patient. Oh, she's getting ready for a question. As you go. Can brought the quantum physics and combined it with the imago therapy, one of the things that I saw you had in your book is that the space between the quantum self and you looked at this quantum self as a wavicle, which you yeah. say is essentially energy, spe specifically yeah. each of us is a point or a knob in the limitless web of the universal energy. And therefore, right. our psyche is no more stable or unchangeable than are any of our manifestations of the universal energy. And in that 
instant quantum consciousness shows up and um, operates in the same way as the cosmos, everything ranging from the largest um, objects to the smallest particles and meaning that the human psyche is neither fixed nor absolute, but rather is in a constant oscillation um, in the context, in the bigger context of that um, oscillation. And what yeah. is bringing that into how you have brought this in um, the beauty of you creating a different context um, in there. And I remember like with Imago conversation before you brought this uh, and developed a new level of the theory that as we sat together, there was this conversation of going back, but each one of the conversations were still about one partner uh, trying to understand the other partner and really looking at the other partner and going forward. But as I've watched some of your videos recently, it has really shifted. And one of the things that I saw that it shifted, which you guys have shared it uh, because it was personal to you, is coming to zero negativity and creating this level of zero negativity within the context of in between. Um, mm -hmm. Can you share about that, please? Well, yes, it, it's so. Uh, I, I think we'd start with the statement about safety that one of the things that has emerged. And Helen emphasizes this even more than I do whenever we're lecturing. She goes, safety, safety, safety. That what we have- um, Safety some, in the energy field safety between in energy two field. people. People connect when there's anxiety. Yeah. People, connection is ruptured. So that we, we start with that assumption that if you want a thriving relationship, you have no, no option but to create safety in the space between. Because if you create danger, and you know, Stephen Porges, who is the author of, uh, you know, the um, Bagel Theory, uh, which is the sort of newest uh, theory out right now, and everybody's learning about the vagal, vagal nerve, uh, made it really clear, has made it really clear in academic books and in popular lectures that safety is essential for thriving. No, I'm sorry, let me say it again. Safety is essential for surviving and that all mammals have to have safety to thrive, including, he said one time in a speech, all mammals have to be safe to thrive, including humans. And so we had been sensing that, but again, had no solid theory in the field to root it in. So with quantum physics and Stephen Porges in bagel theory, this idea about safety just became fixed. That is the one thing that's fixed uh, in the theory. And if you want safety, then the logic is you can't go negative because if you go negative, you trigger the, um, the, uh, um, the midbrain, you, you, you trigger the, the um, amygdala. The amygdala. And the amygdala is sitting there waiting to say, is this safe or dangerous? And that releases cortisol, adrenaline. Yeah, there's a negative yeah. uh, neurochemicals that get released throughout your body and you're not a healthy person. Like you get sick more than other people according to the Mayo Clinic. Yeah. So um, could I add? Sure. Do you say? So this, um, you have to then go to the brain where you mirror someone and the, the sentence stems takes you to the neocortex. And um, I so appreciate how you started our meeting today. That'll be, you know, our Zoom meeting um, where we're recorded and you started saying, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. What you all are saying makes sense. And so makes sense is left brain. And that's part of the dialogue. You know, you mirror someone, you say, but that make mirror, did I get it right? And if I got it right, that makes sense. Now, the next sentence in the sentence terms that we teach people to say is, is there more about that? Now, is there more is being curious and wondering. And that takes a person to the healthiest part of the brain, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And that makes sense as sort of a particle, but the wave is, is there more about that? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know how you feel. 
Mm-hmm. I, I don't, I wonder why you feel that way. Mm-hmm. I don't feel that way. But instead of blaming you or shaming you, can you tell me more? Mm-hmm. Why is your political position what it is? Because mine is the other one. Why would you vote differently? Because I don't understand that political position. Well, instead of judging people and getting conflicted with them, when you, this is going into the wave, when you wonder, and Dan Siegel, my favorite neuroscientist says, um, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is the healthiest part of the brain to live in. And it's, you tolerate ambiguity and you then move beyond predication. So all of us need to learn, and in our relationships, we need to wonder about our partners, not judge them. And this, if you wonder in the dorsolateral dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, you release calm neurochemicals, which I know because I do that with Harville, Mm -hmm. and he does it with me. We wonder about each other. And it's dopamine, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. And you don't have to be mad at your partner. Mm. You can relax. Mm -hmm. And it's their life, their whatever. Yours is different. And you can still coexist in your marriage relationship in a happy way. And what you have said in the quantum couple is uh, presenting it as creating a sustaining, um, a safe environment, identifying earlier life challenges and becoming empathic about it learning yeah. how defense is developed as a result of negative exchanges and removing all the negativity from the interaction and reconnecting to the person who both embodies one's challenges and has the power to help transform them and then connecting with each other in a safe and non-judgmental through the imago dialogue stretching yeah. transform frustrations into requests for changed behaviors and sustaining a wave like quality of flow um, one of the things that I remember and becoming an advocate for celebrating, you know, one's differences and theirs and, um, and practicing presence and renaissancing, uh, resonancing whether, whenever the engage is, is there. One of the beautiful thing I read in your book, you said that the, uh, you know, people live in this fantasy of the relationship is going to create that type of, uh, you know, symbiotic experience and somehow, you know, we need to come back from fantasy to reality that we're all grown ups and, you know, we need to take care of each other. There was one point that I wanted to ask um, the two of you, which um, I remember when you guys had shared in some of the seminars with us um, that although you had created imagotherapy, at one point you had said, that's it, you know, we're not going to be together because, and then you evaluated what was going on between the two of you that although you were doing the, the dialogue, something was not working. And uh, I remember Helen, you said that you noticed that, you know, the anger, the rage, and although you were trying really hard to create this space in between that the internal negativity was still brewing and there was a piece that I'm wondering here where um, in order to create this environment and uh, speak in a way that you are compassionate um, what would you suggest for each person to do in um, in how to funnel that anxiety and rage that is coming up and not have it out or how to uh, shift that within themselves so that they can create the safety. Yeah. So I, I just want to say, since we're going to come back soon and have another um, session with you, uh, I think probably Harvel and I would both really like to unpack that in the second one. And maybe both of us could say a short thing now. Yeah. And, yeah, then, like- and then we can elaborate on the next meeting with you yeah and and i would like to say something short shall i say you say it first and i'll do the second well what so we're still again talking about uh the reason we're talking about safety and anxiety and when people are in their rage and their impassioned rage or whatever behind that is anxiety and rage is a way of managing the because anxiety is that i might disappear from the universe. 
And so rage is a way of hanging on to being. You turn the anxiety into anger, or you could turn it into depression. Anything not to feel anxiety. So that means that what you have to have is a process that creates safety. And otherwise you'll have defenses and we have defenses, then you have polarization and then you have polarization, you've got the power struggle, you've got all the stuff none of us wants. So this is where we discovered, even though we reframe the science from classical physics to quantum physics as the science of, of the um, imago therapy, the dialogue process appeared to have preceded this as a way to create that. So, and the reason, the way, the reason it does it is that dialogue creates structure. <clears throat> and, and a lot of people don't like structure. They just want to go with the flow. And so we say, as Dr. Phil says, how, Dr. Phil says, how's that working for you? Going with the flow, just doing whatever comes up and expressing yourself and saying whatever you think. Um, that doesn't work. Uh, and what you have to have is structure. So the dialogue process creates structure uh, that um, that begins to regulate those feelings. And the second way that that's added to that is that brain theory right now is really emphasizing the predictive feature of the brain, that the brain does not simply see. The brain predicts what it's going to see based on what it saw last. And <clears throat> if you put people in a dialogue process, they are able to predict what's going to happen next. And what they predict is, my partner's going to say, well, let me see if I got that. And then my partner's going to say, did I get you? Oh, and I know instead of my partner saying, well, I don't want to listen to that anymore. Or, let me tell you my point of fact. My partner is not going to do that. They're going to say, let me see if I got it. Did I get it? And as Helen used earlier, is there more about that? My partner's going to show curiosity. And then my partner's going to say, let me see if I'm getting all of this. And then my partner is going to say, well, you make sense. Let me validate that. And then my partner is going to say, and I can imagine how you might be feeling about that, which is empathy. Now the structure has produced safety and connecting. And when you do that reciprocally, now you're moving into that quantum space where the energy field is coherent rather than chaotic. So that would be my first download about that and then again <clears throat> we'll come back on but i will add a sentence or two um in our workshops like basically we weren't doing everything that we told other people to do but in our workshops uh do you remember that we talk about sender responsibility there are the sender yeah. stems but also sender responsibility is the look in your eye when you're talking mm -hmm. and the and your facial expression because you can sometimes say the words of the dialogue but do them uh harville has a great photo in our workshop powerpoints a cat uh <laughs> sitting there looking with cat staring. eyes staring mm -hmm. yes staring and then there's uh, and he said shift from the Cat the, to glare, the, the, the glare, glare to, the gaze. to the gaze and he has a dog like a basset hound looking <laughs> and, and so so this but this was the big thing that changed my relationship with harville was how he looked at me when he was talking no. and now he i just have had tears in my eyes uh he looks at me so lovingly and kindly and i feel i feel I, it's not just words about uh dialogue it's the expression on his face, the look at his eye. So the, the last thing that then we'll, we'll have to go is the look that Helen is talking about also has a quantum ground in quantum physics. is how you look at a particle when you are experimenting with it determines how the particle shows up. The particle is not a thing that is independent of the observer. So when, when we talk about the impact of the look, I constellate in Helen how she responds to me by the way I look at her. And quantum field theory uh, grounds that in a thing called the double slit experiment in which the way the researcher looks at the particle determines whether the particle is a wave or a particle. So 
I think we're going to have to go with that and, and but throw it back to you for the for the final thing. Um, yes, yeah, so what I'm hearing from you is that when uh, the structure of the Imago dialogue, as it's created, it's uh, set up to create the safety. So no matter how much you're activated internally, as yeah. you go into the safe structure of the, uh, of the uh, dialogue, that that starts dissipating because the environment that that dialogue get, creates is exactly. that safety and then so therefore within it even if one person of the two which has a little bit of a less uh type of uh engagement in this uh, is starting to create that type of love that comes through your eyes that right. essence of empathicness that comes yeah, so it's both structure structure and uh an energy field mm -hmm. and with that uh we really need to go and yeah. we'll say more next time. We'll unpack that. We'll unpack that. But uh, you, uh, for last wording though, you want there were a couple of things you wanted to share, which was something you did big in that. No, I'm sorry, we have to go. I'm so sorry. Okay, well. Okay. Can we share it again? Yes. We, something came up and we have to. All right, well, I will enjoy, we will all enjoy our conversation with you next uh, in a couple of weeks again. So thank okay, you so much great. for coming and being Thank you for understanding our schedule today. Of course.